Hi, this is uh, Jeremy Strickland. I'm a chief of staff at Google. Jeremy, thanks so much for finding time to join us uh, on the Vive podcast on this Friday afternoon, April 30th. The reason I include the date is because lately I've been getting some comments around that some of the episodes appear to be maybe a little out of date or maybe not within the trends. <laughs> so we started doing that. Uh, where, where are you based at? Yeah, so uh, I'm based out of San Francisco, uh, but due to COVID reasons, my wife and I have been coveting, as we like to say, uh, in Grosse Point, Michigan, which is about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. Oh, very cool. Wow, in a completely different location, right? Um, I want to spend some time talking about your current role in, within the organization, but before we do that, tell us a little bit more kind of the thumbnail version of your career timeline. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess I'll I'll start with my kind of my first job out of undergrad. So graduated from Vanderbilt in 2011, uh, and then I joined Google for the first time. Uh, so I uh, immediately came to Google as part of their new uh, graduate program. I spent two years uh, doing small and media business sales and support before transitioning to a more uh, analyst or operational type role. I spent roughly around six months as a business analyst before transitioning to a strategy and operations lead. Um, this latter role was really kind of my favorite time at Google. So working on super complex projects um, with really high performing individuals. In total, I was at Google for about five years before I went to graduate school. I did my MBA at Kellogg and then a master's of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School over a three year period. After that, uh, I briefly joined LinkedIn, where I was a manager on our sales innovation team before uh, recently returning to Google in my current role as chief of staff, which is uh, just an ideal and perfect role for me. <laughs> That's awesome. What a, what a quite diverse uh, background and I appreciate you sharing. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the role as a chief of staff. It's, I understand the what falls under your purview and the responsibility especially the last few years that particular uh, that role has been gaining a lot of ground in terms of a lot of organizations yeah. raising the specific need for that but not a lot of people may be familiar with with that the overall concept share a little bit more insight into that the day-to-day -day responsibilities what falls under your purview yeah absolutely there's so much to just unpack there but it's uh it really is a super exciting role. The first thing that I like to tell people about being a chief of staff is, is this role is not for everyone, right? The pace of this role is just really, really intense. So the only thing that I can equate it to is, you know, I did uh, investment banking uh, at Goldman for my internship. It's that pace, but not quite as long of the hours, but you're always on call. Um, so some of the phrases that I like to describe the chief of staff job that I think resonate with other people in this role are you're an inch deep on many projects, but you're about two miles wide. Um, so one of the things that my executive and I, we do on a weekly basis is we just review the priorities of my projects. And I think at one point I was up to 30 different projects that I was touching or helping to manage or, um, you know, helping to manage the managers on those projects. And so I think that's really interesting. You have to keep this rotation of what is most important, what's going to drive the most value for the business. And, you know, if I can only work, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, where, where is it that I'm going to spend my time? Um, and so I think that's, that's super interesting. Um, so in terms of like chief of staff, so I, you know, it's definitely been growing in Silicon Valley over the last few years in terms of interest I think as, as more and more tech companies begin to grow, they start to understand and realize that the founder often is not the executive who is going to be able to kind of grow and scale the company. And so the type of value that someone like myself can bring is really you know, kind of being that go-between, helping provide that operational rigor, strategic insight, um, and just kind of being able to scale that, uh, that executive. Right. And so I have the good fortune of doing this at Google. So I work for a leader who has been at Google for, gosh, over a decade. She's a phenomenal leader. She's a great people manager. And she understands her business uh, better than anybody I've ever worked for. And it is truly just 
exciting and inspirational to see how she operates. Um, so with that uh, in mind, um, I'm happy to go into kind of more of like day-to-day -day responsibilities, but I'll toss it back to you in case you have, may have a specific area you want to double click on. No, I love that. that I, love, I appreciate the background and the insight more into the specific role. And I agree, definitely, especially in our circles in the technology startup community or technology organizations has been a growing trend. Uh, but I also see, I interact with a lot of executives at other industries and mm -hmm. other organizations organizations and has been definitely getting ground as far as that particular functional domain within the organization. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the career path. It seems like yeah. you're at the executive level. You interact mostly with executives. So you do a lot of also like the advising and the coaching almost to, to a certain extent. What's the path mm -hmm. to chief of staff and beyond that? Yeah, absolutely. So I can talk about like kind of my my path here, right? And so coming out of business school, I took uh, what was basically just like a uh, managerial position at, at LinkedIn. And LinkedIn's a really great firm, but I just didn't feel that that was the right role that played to my talents. I think I'm somebody who does really well uh, when I have a bunch of different projects on my plate um, and can navigate uh, among those different projects. And I enjoy that a lot more than having to go really, really deep uh, into projects. So what I didn't love about the kind of managerial position that I had at LinkedIn was as we were working on the CRM migration and I was helping to lead that project, huge, critically important project, um, but I just wasn't super interested or motivated by the work. And so when I transitioned to, to Google and was thinking about, or before I even transitioned to Google, what my next role would be, you know, did it make sense to move from like a people management position and uh, to something at the back to where I would be an individual contributor again? And so the only thing that I could think of that really made sense to me was this chief of staff role. And the way that I think about it is most people in a chief of staff role because of the pace of the role um, and just how strung out you are over all of your different projects, all of your different stakeholders, there tends to be a high burnout rate of about two to three years. So if you look at the most famous chief of staff role uh, to the president, um, I think average tenure in that job is, is, is just a little over a year. And that's just because of the high nature or the high paced and just quick nature of the role. And so that was kind of my plan was to come in, support this executive. It was an area that is growing very, very quickly at Google, well-respected executive based on the due diligence that I did. And, um, and so that's ultimately how I ended up here. But I think, you know, in all my day to day, who do I interact with the most? So directly support my executive. Uh, and then she has a set of basically head of heads or uh, somewhere, somewhere which are at the director level that report to her. Uh, and predominantly, I work with uh, two or three of those uh, basically heads or directors more than others. So of the, of the, gosh, like six or seven that report to her. You know, I mainly focus in and help drive uh, it, drive work and value uh, with, uh, with a couple of those more than others. So I think it's good because I get exposure cross-functionally across all of everything that Google has to offer from marketing, sales, engineering, um, support, uh, implementation side of the business, et cetera. And it's kind of it's kind of great because with like thinking about moving from like a people manager role to like an individual contributor role with a chief of staff role, like the thing that somebody told me that didn't make sense until I got in this role is no one reports to you, but everyone reports to you. And so I think that's a really interesting phrase to think about, because while, you know, I'm not re directly responsible for the performance manage of everyone, I have the what I hope is the trust of my executive and um and, you know, when I'm recommending something on a project, people tend to listen. Uh, and so that's a, a really great position to, to have. Well, that's very exciting. And it definitely paints a much bigger picture in terms of the area of responsibility as a chief of staff. And being able to get ex so much exposure all across, seems like the entire organization, different domain areas, different types of leadership within the organization that also creates a lot of opportunities for you to learn, absorb as much as possible. So I think that's super exciting. 
Um, tell us about any specific challenges that come along with that particular responsibility. What are yeah. some of the things that maybe you did not expect or something that was really, you know, you, you did as much research as you could prepare yourself for that particular role, but what were some of the kind of the aha moments or some of the gotcha, so to say? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it starts with, you have to have a clear vision of what your job is, right? And so my job is to basically scale the effectiveness of my executive. And I think that goes with the general kind of foundational value that I have of this role. So chief of staff, you are not a chief, you are staff, right? And your job is not to make decisions. Your job is to help the executive make the best and most informed decision possible, right? And so that means helping to guide, helping to inform, helping provide options, pushing back when, when you know, you don't agree, right? And doing so uh, thoughtfully and respectfully. So what were some of the challenges that I face? You know, I think with anybody who's new to this role and had never been a, a chief of staff before, um, it's really learning how there, what is the best way to gain the trust of your executive. And I think that's something that, that I did pretty well. And the way that I did that was really trying to connect on like a personal level and then really spending a lot of time with, with her direct reports, uh, getting to know them. So I, I set a personal goal for myself of like my first 45 days in the role to meet with all of our important stakeholders. At the end of that 45 days, I counted up the number of different one-on-ones that I have. I think I was at something like 52. Um, and so that's just an incredible, you know, number of just amount of time that I spent introducing myself, getting to know others, getting to know about people's families, their interests and their hobbies, right? And so I think that that was like one thing that I, that many people could potentially struggle with in this role is undervaluing uh, how important it is to be proactive in like your networking. Now, the thing that I found that was just like, whoa, oh my gosh, this is over my head at this point is I mentioned a bit earlier being inch deep in a, in a couple of miles wide. You know, those first couple of months, you're just trying to get up to speed, right? You're trying to learn to lead through the product. You're trying to learn the personalities. And you're given exposure to 15, 20 different projects. And you have no idea what many of the acronyms mean, who are some of the key players, um, what are the kind of uh, historical precedents behind many of these projects. And so it was definitely the uh, thing that I always mention to people, the experience for me was definitely the, like the Dunning-Kruger effect or Dunning-Kruger effect, which is you come in, you have a couple of quick wins, you add value. People are like, hey, this guy's pretty smart. Like, you know, maybe he can put some more operational rigor and then you get exposure and then maybe you're on one or two projects at that point. Then you get exposure to 20 or 30 different projects and you're like, oh my God, I am at like this sea of despair. I have no idea what I'm going to do. They are going to fire me in two weeks. I'm a big fraud. And then slowly over time, you just start building back up, building back up, building back up to where you hit like that, you know, six month mark or so you feel pretty comfortable where you're like, all right, you know, I have this, I have these 20 or so projects on my plate. I know the two or three that really matter. I know the two or three that I can completely like offload and that person's going to take care of. And then I know the ones that are like, people are going to tell me this is important, but it's not really that important. And so you kind of just like slowly build back up until you hit this like plateau. And then that plateau is like you're feeling comfortable in your job. And then you start taking on new responsibilities, um, you know, prepping for meetings on things you don't know about. So you have to do research on them that are kind of stretch you a little bit more and more. And so I think of it, if you're familiar with, you know, the, um, the dining tour effect, like I definitely like uh, say that that is absolutely very true of this role because you have like your your valley of of despair and like you think that you're a fraud but you, you know you slowly come out of it yeah it seems you know it definitely resonates and as far as in terms of the lack of maybe clarity around the specific responsibilities that you have to you know you have to take on as a chief of staff was that something that was a concern to you or do you on the opposite spectrum do you actually operate it a lot better from that standpoint? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that I've been told that I do well, and 
I think there's always room for improvement on anything you do well to be even better at it is, is manage uh, ambiguity. And I manage that through like relentless prioritization. Mm -hmm. Like, look, here, here are the projects that we're working on together. I think, I, I think these are the top five. Let's confirm that. And that's what we do on a, on a weekly basis. And then to say like, hey, okay, how, how can I begin to drive value on this? Or this, this is the team that we need to build to, to work on this. Or am I leading this project or am I supporting? Right. And so I think what many people would be interested in is like for somebody in this role, what, what do you, what do I kind of do? Right. And so I thought about, you know, if my end goal is to scale the effectiveness of my executive, you know, what are the levers that I have to do so? And so I kind of think of those in like four big buckets and I'll just kind of break those down. Yes. I'm breaking the rule of three for all the consultants out there. Um, so the first one is basically, you know, thinking about like strategic priorities so really helping to identify major trends uh, in the business, um, thinking about where we want the executive uh, to uh, basically plug in versus what I can lead. And then also just kind of generally acting as a gatekeeper, right? And acting as that filter for all of the requests that come in. So that's kind of one is being, uh, is being I call it the personal confidant of the executive or you know, helping to set strategic priorities. The second one, is really thinking about uh, program or project management, right? Uh, when you're a chief of staff, you know, we have a organization that we've built and oftentimes there'll be projects that just don't fit very well um, within that organization. And so it requires somebody who has the purview and scope to sit across many of those, you know, directors or heads of industries that are the next level down and drive those, drive those projects. Uh, and then the third area, is really, I would think, like strategic planning and alignment, otherwise known as a really fancy way of just saying operational rigor. So one of the big things that we do is just basically just understand what is the process that we're doing for something that's really important today? What are the pain points? Where can we clean this up? Uh, where can we streamline things? Where can we make it more efficient? And then it's really just asking the question of like, this is how we've done it in the past. Do we need to do it this way in the future? And one of the big projects that I'm on right now um, you know, we had, uh, my predecessor had done a pro had done some work on it, had improved the overall flow of it tremendously, but me being new to the organization allowed me to take a step back again and say like, Hey, okay, we took a, you know, a big step forward last time. How can we take two more steps forward and really, really, really drive and scale this process. And then, you know, thinking about the last lever is really thinking about how you can effectively communicate the message of the executive out to not only her direct reports or his or her direct reports, but to everyone in the organization to make sure that they are motivated, um, that they are interested in the work and that they will be excited about working, um, you know, at the company or for this particular person. Yeah, that's very interesting. And at, at Google, I'm sure you, <clears throat> you're exposed to all kinds of different trends, ideas, projects, and so forth. What are some of your personal passions these days that you follow, you know, very, you know, very extensively? What are some of the trends and ideas that really excite you? What are you perhaps looking to invest in yourself or research yeah. further? Share with us. Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of interesting because when I think about this question, I think about my work persona, which is very much, you know, I work in this strategic uh, realm of kind of digital marketing, right? So when you think about Google as a whole, and this is just my own two thoughts, it's digital marketing, it's advertising, et cetera. And so I feel like I get such great exposure to that uh, at work through all of the different think pieces that we have, the external literature, et cetera. So when I'm not working on something directly related to Google, I tend to focus on my other areas of interest and my own personal uh, like research projects. So for me, that kind of dates back to some of the work that I did while I was in graduate school. As part of the MPP MBA program, you have to write what I call is like a dissertation light. And mine was on, or I wrote mine on, uh, autonomous vehicle regulatory policy. And so this is an area that I've continued to stay pretty intimately involved in outside of the office. Done a few different podcasts. Uh, I have done, you know, speaking engagements at at VCs, major law firms in Silicon Valley. And it's something that I really enjoy building that domain expertise. Do I get to bring that to my day job at Google? Not exactly, but it is, is it something that I enjoy doing and writing an occasional medium post on? Absolutely. 
Um, so predominantly when I'm outside of the office, I tend to work on things like that. That's led to uh, some consulting work that I've done with a startup uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. The name of the startup is called Pied Parker. And they think of themselves really as a transportation company, but their conduit to becoming a larger transportation provider is through parking. And so we're really thinking about ways that we can improve and disrupt uh, the current kind of parking environment or landscape. It's a very old analog solution based business. And we think through technology, uh, we really have the opportunity to disrupt that. And so it's been great bringing my operational rigor, strategic mindset to this startup uh, who is basically doing extremely well, but they're operating at light speed. And so it's really just thinking about like, hey, how do we put together a comprehensive hiring plan? Or, you know, how can we begin to recruit top talent from MBA programs? Or thinking about the future of our company, how can we start to put the pieces in place that get us ready to become, you know, to grow, you know, X percent uh, and become an even larger company, so. Yeah, no, those are very exciting trends and absolutely very relevant to the current market conditions and a lot of things that are going on these days. When it comes to um, working remotely and mm -hmm. part maybe some hybrid model, um, I, I spent a lot of time also with executives who are clients of mine and a good deal of topics that we discuss is, you know, they come and we they just basically say, John, you know, some of our newly hired employees that just joined the organization, a lot of them struggle, uh, especially during that initial period, especially when you just joined the organization, maybe last year, when everything is 100% remote, and you're not so used to this particular setup, where, you know, you in the in the normal scenario, you'll have a lot of opportunities to meet new folks and just run into people. Uh, or just casually, you know, have a hallway conversation. What are your thoughts and maybe some strategies that really help you, some of the folks that are just joining the organization mm -hmm. or, you know, don't have necessarily a lot of experience working remotely yeah. in terms of being able to collaborate with others, but also expand their internal networks within the organization? Absolutely. Uh, I have some, just some low hanging fruit here that I think could be really helpful for folks. First and foremost is don't underestimate or undervalue the importance of creating a workspace that you feel comfortable in, right? And so when I first started working remotely, I was just working from the dining room table. And what I realized after a few months is that I was just miserable, right? It, the, simply the table was too small. Um, I couldn't, we really didn't have a place to eat when my monitor and stuff was there. And so I invested um, when I started at Google in really putting together a much better office setup. And I think that that increased my not only happiness of the work that I was doing, but also my productivity, right? So that's low hanging fruit uh, tidbit number one. The second one is, is something I've already mentioned earlier is put yourself out there and network, right? Especially for somebody who's in a similar role to me or who's gonna be touching you know, a lot of cross-functional projects. Set yourself a goal, your first 30, your first 45 days, get out there and network. Identify a list of people with or uh, points of contact with whom you're going to be interacting with on a consistent basis, and then just start meeting with them. And in your conversations, introduce yourself, find out more about them. Those initial introductory chats, try to keep it about, you know, I say 10 to 15 minutes on just who they are as a person, what they like to do. And then 10 to 15 minutes on like, what are their biggest, you know, strategic priorities, right? Or what they, what keeps them up at night or anything else along those lines. So that's networking that you can proactively do. Um, another thing that I've found that is really great is we have a series of kind of coffee chats within our organization. And so this is run by some of our um, basically individual sales folks. And what they do is everybody enters their, enter their names. And then uh, once every month or so, we just have a coffee chat. It'll match people all the way from our executive to like the person who's it's day two on the job, right? Um, like right out of, right at, coming in from an agency or something like that. And so I think it's been really great to do that because it's given me the opportunity to chat with some of our frontline employees and for them to kind of understand what I do and how I'm their advocate and their voice, right? So for anybody that's new to do, to the whole like working from home thing, 
talk to your executive, talk to your manager and say like, hey, let's create these, you know, these informal coffee chats once a month. And let's mix and match people throughout all of the, all, all of the uh, organization. I think it's a quick win for many people. I don't think you're going to get a lot of pushback unless you're working like in investment banking, but especially at tech companies, um, I think that would go over pretty well. And I think it's just organizing and putting it together. Yeah, those are great strategies, especially, you know, an organization of that size. I think it's also very interesting to hear, you know, initiatives such as, you know, proactive monthly meetups where you get a chance and opportunity to meet others, maybe completely outside of your uh, functional area or outside of your team that you're operating in. So that's that's a great strategy for a lot of executives to take into account uh, within their organizations. It's it's something that I really pride in because like I think about what I work on at the very high strategic level, look, it trickles down uh, to, to these folks. Right. And so yeah. it impacts, you know, what they're doing on a daily basis. And so it's great to hear, you know, what's working, what isn't and uh, take take that back up up the chain. Right. So absolutely. You've mentioned something as we were talking about the different trends and ideas and building the culture, you know, within the organization on hiring and surrounding yourself with, you, you know, with just top of the line candidates and uh, retention also becomes a challenge, especially in this current market, uh, mm -hmm. where a lot of executives actually thought that shifting to virtual is going to open up a whole, you know, gamut of opportunities to new candidates, but also mm -hmm. competition had increased as well. Uh, what are your overall thoughts on uh, just talent acquisition aspect of where it is in the current market. How do you approach this? How, what are some of the things that really help you succeed in the space of talent acquisition, interviewing and surrounding yourself with A players? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna harken back to something that I heard from Meg Garlinghouse, um, who I, I don't know her official title at LinkedIn, but I think she's the uh, kind of head of, of, of CSR, cor Corporate Social Responsibility, something similar to that. Um, but she's been at LinkedIn for a very long time. And so one of her kind of big tenets that she believes in is diversity of your network, right? And so it's really thinking about, hey, look, look here, my, my, my things, characteristics that define me, you know, I'm a mid 30s uh, Caucasian male living in the Midwest right now, previously uh, in San Francisco, I make, you know, X amount a year, et cetera, right? Who adds more value to my network? Somebody who is 28 in Chicago and maybe makes 50 grand more than I do, but works in, you know, PE or something like that, or somebody who is really diverse and works in Florida, maybe uh, comes from a non-traditional background, didn't go to an Ivy League school, but has been a really successful entrepreneur, uh, in the consumer goods industry. And so I think what she would say is that latter person uh, is actually adds more value to your network. And so the reason why I bring all of that up, and I swear there's a point to this, is as we think about remote working, right? One of the things that it does is it unlocks the potential value of finding those people who are not co-located where your job is, right? So by defining where a job sits, you inherently limit the applicant pool that you will get to people who are either A, willing to relocate there, people who are already there, or people who are gonna try and change your mind about where this job needs to be, right? And so, and this is completely aside of Google, these are just purely my own thoughts. Uh, I think what it does is it really helps to improve that network diversity and help us find uh, candidates that would not typically fit a traditional hiring profile that can bring and add value in a typical way or in an atypical way. Um, and so what does that mean? So if we're bringing in more diverse candidates, we're getting different opinions. What we need to do as a leadership and as a management group is we need to make sure that we're setting up those candidates for success when we bring them in. And I think there's a few fundamental tenets there that I believe in that, uh, that I think really promote this. First and foremost, it's aligning impact to vision, right? Understanding how the person is going to be able to contribute to an overarching goal of the organization or for the company as a whole. I think the second is, is ensuring that there is the minimum level of hard and soft skills the person needs to achieve in that role. So in particular, thinking about somebody who 
come is coming in with a non-traditional background, maybe in writing or something like that, writing or policy, but they're taking on more of a data and analytical role because that's the, the move they want to make in their career, right? How can we help enable them by building those soft skills, you know, the networking, the understanding how to communicate along with those hard skills of rigorous data analysis, you know, regression analysis, et cetera. And then I think the third component of that is really building that community aspect. So really understanding how can we find people who aren't the person's direct manager, but mentors and buddies and other folks who they can just have candid conversations with. You know, in, in my role as, as uh, that I have now, there were many things that I would get forwarded on emails when I first started in this role. I'd be like, I have no idea if I need to do this or not, right? And so there's another person who's in a similar role to me. I would just forward him the email. I'm like, hey, do you do anything with this? And his response usually back was, nope, but if I should, let me know. And so just like having somebody like that, that I could just forward an email to, uh, just as a quick gut check when I had no idea what something is, um, you know, really made me comfortable and secure in my role and really accelerated my ability to, to do this role well and do it pretty quickly. Right, right, right. No, that's very, you know, very interesting perspectives into that particular topic, which I'm sure we can probably riff on on the entire episode yeah. on its own. So I appreciate it. Well, look, 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 man, like all the things everybody else says, like, you know, pay people well, treat them, treat them right. well, <laughs> you know, lead with appreciation. I think those are also critically important, right? But like, like you can go to any other, any other book, any other podcast, and you can find that stuff. And here's the way that I think about these things, right? And you know, it's like maybe it's a little bit different, but you know, maybe that's a unique value add that I hopefully have on that particular topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, yeah, it's it's such a it's such a broad and very you know sensitive topic as well. That's very relevant to the current market and where we at in you know in just in general in time coming out of pandemic and moving on to the next period it's it's very interesting um and jeremy in closure i like to talk a little bit about your your content diet uh what are some of mm-hmm. the sources that you you utilize on a daily basis for self-actualization for learning share with us uh any any sources that may be helpful yeah, absolutely. Um, so other than just having sports in around in the background, uh, no, I, I'm joking. That was, uh, that was, uh, you know, early and mid twenties, Jeremy, for sure. Uh, but no, okay. So what do, what do I actually digest on a daily basis? Um, so I like to start my morning off with something a little bit fun, a little bit playful. I love the morning brew, uh, newsletter, uh, for anybody else, for anybody out there who hasn't subscribed to that. I think it's a good way to get a quick snippet on what's going on in the world in a kind of fun and quickly digestible way. Uh, I am an advocate uh, podcast listener, so I love Planet Money. I love Freakonomics, uh, This American Life. I think that those um, bring together a lot of what I like, which is behavioral science, you know, data-driven, uh, basically insights, and really bringing it back up to that high level of what does this mean and what is this, how does this impact society? Um, so I would say you got a newsletter there. We've got uh, a podcast, a couple podcasts I really enjoy. Um, on my reading shelf or bookshelf at the moment, uh, what I'm reading is a book called The Gatekeepers by Chris Flipple. So being new to the chief of staff role, I wanted to read, you know, the, from the authority on what it was like to be a chief of staff. And so a former, uh, actually manager of mine recommended this book. And what it does is it really just looks at how chief of staffs play an important role to uh, the president of the United States and how a good chief of staff can lead to a very successful presidency and how a bad chief of staff can all, can very nearly ruin uh, what is considered uh, to be a good presidency. And there are all shades and degrees in between, right? And so that's given me perspective on how I can do my role um, a little bit better, right? Uh, some of the things that work in terms of when to be a bulldog versus, you know, when to be a pacifier, right? Um, and so I think that's really interesting. And then uh, finally, for for fun, my wife and I, we just finished the very last season of Ray Donovan. Uh, and I am, so that's the show that we watch together. And then I am finishing up um, the very last season of Homeland, which I have been working on for about the last year or so. <laughs> yeah, those are great resources. And thanks for sharing those. 
Uh, last but not least, uh, is there a book that you always recommend to others and why is that? Oh, that's really great. So I would definitely recommend uh, the Gatekeeper's book. If you are interested in politics at all, uh, I think that this one is is really, really exciting, um, right? Um, you know, there's a, there's a few books throughout throughout my lifetime that I've thought that are really kind of informative and influential on some of the things that I believe in. Um, I really enjoy autobiographies. Uh, and so, or autobiographies and just biographies, however, you know, with ghost writers nowadays. Um, so for anybody that who hasn't, every time a new presidential autobiography or biography comes out, I always read those. Um, so next one up on my bookshelf is, um, Obama's I, I read, uh, I've read Clinton's, I read, uh, Bush's before that. And so that's been really, really interesting and great. Um, other things that I would, you know, kind of recommend to, to folks. Like this is going to be a, a super boring answer, but I think one of the things that I that really differentiate people uh, in my role or other strategic roles is the ability to quickly communicate, quickly and effectively communicate, and understanding the different types of logic models that you can use to get a point across, and really thinking deeply about what does the other person hope to achieve and how can I communicate that question quickly. Therefore, I think uh, a really good resource uh, for people would be uh, like the Minto Pyramid. For anybody who hasn't read that, um, I know it is a bit challenging to get your hands on a copy because uh, it, it's not readily available on Amazon most times. But I think that that is one of the most fundamentally important uh, business books uh, that, that, I have, uh, that I have ever read. Um, so I think, those are, I think that's good. You know, there's a lot of other books that I can read. Another personal favorite of mine is Extreme Ownership. Um, so for uh, those that are unfamiliar with that book, it was written by a former uh, Navy SEAL about how he and his team kind of practice leadership uh, and during some of their, um, some of their you know, campaigns uh, during various wars. And so I think that that is something that I have definitely adopted is this idea of extreme ownership. And uh, one, uh, one that I would encourage others to adopt along with reading what is a extremely informative and fun book. Those are great recommendations, Jeremy. And for our listeners, we'll make those available in the episode notes. I uh, can't thank you enough for your time today. Uh, personally, learned quite a bit. So lots of great insights. Definitely going to stay in touch with you. Perhaps we can do another episode in near future next year and see, uh, see how much have changed and transpired. That sounds excellent. You know, always happy to happy to be here. It's been great getting to to know you and to chat with you. And uh, you know, hopefully, I I uh, didn't lose you too many listeners along the way. <laughs> Much appreciated.